Everybody to our webinar this evening called Climate Change in Australia and the Need for Action. I'm Heather Campbell, the CEO of Bush Heritage, and I'm your host and MC for this evening. I'm coming tonight to you from Wurundjeri Country on the edge of the Yarra Valley in the hills and at the moment and the rain. So I'm coming to you from my dining room and I know that many of you will be coming to us from your homes or different parts of Australia. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people and all the traditional owners on the land in which Bush Heritage operates and where we're all sitting tonight. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. One of the features that we are going to use this evening is the chat box and the Q&A functions. So to start us off, I'd really like if all of you could just type into the chat on Zoom the country that you're sitting on, whether that be in Australia or whether it be First Nations people from other parts of the world, so that we can share some of those. Now you won't be able to see that, but I've got the, uh, the trusty phone here, so I can actually see uh, some of the things or places that you where you're coming from. And what is great too is I see that we've got you know we've got Steve online, we've got Mike Alana, we've got people from Noongar country, from Gadigal country, from Wurundjeri and Melbourne. So it's great to actually see that we've got people joining us from all over the place, which is absolutely fantastic. I can see lots of Victorians from the uh, from Gip land from uh, up in Emerald. We've also got people coming to us from the West and coming to us from Sydney. Uh, here we go, we've got Pete from Perth. So welcome everybody to what will be a fun packed evening. Now just a couple of I suppose sort of housekeeping things so that we can uh, be cognizant of how this will work this evening. So we're going to have a fantastic presentation and then we're going to do Q&A. What is really important for that is can you please type your questions when you think of them? Because sometimes, you know, you might forget if you wait till the end. So please use that Q&A little box to type in your questions. In relationship to the chat box, you can use that to send messages, particularly to Anna, who will be sitting in the back um, making sure that we're all happy and we're all under, under control and that the systems, etc., are working. Also, if you are having technical difficulties, please use the chat function or you can use the email, which is events at bushheritage.org.au. What you may have noticed as we go through this presentation is at times I may go a little fuzzy. That's because I stupidly 20 years ago built a house down a valley, so I'm operating on satellite. And what we've found in our past webinars is sometimes connectivity is not great. So we're doing something a little bit unusual tonight because we wanted to make sure that everybody got the opportunity to hear Sue. So what we've done is we've 
pre-recorded Sue's presentation so that we don't have any glitches or slides freezing and all those sort of things. But please believe Sue and I are here the whole time. So we'll be listening to that presentation too and we'll be rearing and waiting for those questions and answers. But it's just some of you that have been in our past webinars will recognize as we've tried to do them completely live, particularly with sharing of slides, that we've had some challenges, uh, particularly when we've been on satellite connections or other connections that have been challenged by weather, etc. So hopefully you then understand um, how to use the Q&A function and thank you for everybody that has typed on where they are. So I'll just run through a few more. Uh, we've got Leonie and, and Andrew from uh, the Melbourne area. We've got Leanne uh, from the Netherlands. So so welcome. That's a, a long way to, to dial in for us. We've got um, Anne from the Illawarra area. Um, we've got people from uh, Buna and Queensland, from Albany, from Wajak, Noongar country in Perth, from Wurundjeri and Mitcham. So a huge group of people. So thank you so much for joining us. So I'd like to introduce Sue. Sue O'Connor is president of Bush Heritage Australia, and she comes with a wealth of knowledge of climate change, of technology, of, of low carbon and working with utilities and financial services. She's a really experienced executive um, and non-executive director, as well as she has an amazing eye. She's a, a photographic artist, which is fantastic. And it's been great as we've seen a number of uh, the images that she shared online. She comes coming us to us tonight with a breadth of experience on climate change that she has got from being chair of Yarra Valley Water, which is a water authority here in Victoria, being on the board of Climate Works, which is an organisation focused on climate policy. And she has other roles where she's on the board of Mercer Superannuation, on the board of the Cordia Group, and the board of the Treasury Corporation Victoria. So a huge raft of experience, and it's great that Sue's able to share the insights that she has from all of that experience and her many years as an executive on what is a critical topic for us here in Australia. So we're now going to pass over to the presentation. Uh, enjoy it, let's be stimulated. Think of all of those questions and then we'll get stuck into Q&A. So please, throughout the presentation, type away with your questions uh, so that we can then have a fantastic Q&A session afterwards. So here we go. Thank you to all of you. It's a pleasure to join you here this evening to discuss the important topic of climate change and the need for action to ensure that Australia and the world achieve the goal of keeping temperature increase to well below two degrees. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the impact of climate change on Australia look at how some organisations are successfully addressing it, and then talk about what we can do as individuals, communities and organisations to address this important issue, an issue that is affecting our lives and the lives of our children and grandchildren. First, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I live, the Wurundjeri people. I would like to acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging, I know that people are joining this webinar from around the country, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands in Australia and acknowledge their elders and any elders who are present with us this evening. Tonight, I'm going to be focusing on the what and the how of acting on climate change. In preparing this talk, I have assumed that you understand and have accepted the science of the cause of global climate change. If this is a question, that you still want to explore further, there are great resources and presentations elsewhere for you to access. I first got involved in the water industry in 2008 when I joined the board of Goulburn Valley Water in Shepparton. It was towards the end of the millennium drought and my goodness, it was dry. Around 2006, towards the end of the drought, the water industry really committed to understanding and acting on the impact of climate change. By starting in 2006, people had built capability, expertise and understanding because boy, the water industry needs it. In 2015, I became chair of Yarra Valley Water, the largest water retailer in Victoria. 
We supply 30% of Victoria's population, mainly in Melbourne and the surrounds. A feature of the water industry is that we need to think and plan simultaneously about both this year and 50 years ahead. To help us in our thinking, we asked the Bureau of Meteorology to join a strategic planning session to discuss po possible climate change scenarios and their impact on the rivers, stream flows, dams and the environment. They presented their scenarios based on 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees and 4 degrees increases. We had what I can only describe as the barbecue stopper moment when they presented these models. At a four degree increase, the bomb was predicting that the Yarra River would stop flowing because of low rainfall. The Yarra is an important source of drinking water for Melbourne. At the same time, by 2050, Melbourne's population is predicted to double. Combining a doubling in demand from population growth and a halving of stream flow because of climate change creates a scenario for forecasts that look like this. This is the 45 year water forecast. In high population growth and severe climate change scenario, under the existing way that we operate, we would be short by 450 gigalitres of drinking water every year. To give you a Melbourne sizing, that's the equivalent of 285 MCGs or just under one Sydney Harbour full of drinking water each year. I can't think of a more compelling call to action to build resilience to the impacts of climate change and transition, and transition to a net zero operations and change the way we work. Our community expects us to. They have also told us that in addition to responding to climate change, they expect us to act in a way that cares for and restores the environment and looks after vulnerable customers. And they are committed to working with us. Later in the presentation, I'll talk to you about some of the approaches that Yarra Valley Water is taking to deal with this challenge. So how is climate change affecting the broader Australia? I want to call out Professor David Caroli, leader of Earth Systems and Climate Change Hub at CSIRO for his assistance in explaining this research to me. Any mistakes I make in presenting the data are mine and mine alone. First, let's look at rainfall. The rainfall patterns are changing. This slide shows summer and winter rainfall over 10 years. In this slide, dark blue indicates highest rainfall on record, dark red is the lowest on record. As you can see, the rainfall patterns are quite changing significantly and quite differently around the country. Interestingly, responding to this change, dairy farmers in Northern Victoria in 2008 were already switching pasture types to deal with drier winters and hotter climates. And what is happening to the temperature? A feature of the Australian climate is its variability. As we forecast forward, we need to be able to factor in both the variability and the climate change impact. The work completed by CSIRO and BOM in the State of the Climate Analysis addresses this question. They have synthesised the results of 30 different climate models to develop models of future temperatures and cast to previously observed climate. So let me take you through this slide. This slide looks to separate out the impact of human influence on any changes in temperature. The x-axis is the years, the y-axis is the variation from the mean temperature from 1900 to 1910. The blue shading represents the results of, of the simulation without human impact and the grey is with human impact. The or orange is the future simulated climate. The line graphs show the actual and 10-year running mean. This is a sobering picture. It shows that without human impact, the temperatures would have stayed at around the 1900 to 1910 numbers with a slight increase. Factoring in human impact shows a steady temperature increase, especially from the 1950s. So what are the forward forecasts for the impact of increasing temperatures on Australia? This is the summary slide from the State of the Climate Report in 2018. It predicts increase in air and sea temperature, increases in storms and bushfire risk, 
and we are already seeing these changes. Anyone impacted by the black summer bushfires will remember this graphically. Climate change has been declared a systemic risk to the Australian financial system by both the financial regu regulator and the Reserve Bank of Australia. With news and forecasts such as these, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. But I think that this is the moment where we have a choice. We can despair at the difficulties we are facing, or we can lean in and become agents of change. We can allow the bush that we all love to wither away and be lost, or be active participants in protecting, adapting and restoring it. We can accelerate the transition to a low carbon world by leading and participating in the changes that we need to make, because the next 10 years are very important. We all need to make a choice, and it's an individual choice. For me, I've made the active decision to lean in. It's why I've joined a number of boards to make my contribution to organisations that are on the front line of dealing with climate change. Because for me to have hope, I need to intervene to work with others to help to change the shape of the future. And to succeed to create this better future, to ensure that we deliver on the Paris goal of keeping temperature increase under 1.5 degrees, it takes collective, unrelenting and urgent effort. It takes a coalition of the willing committed to change and action. Individuals, communities, farmers, scientists, traditional owners, donors, philanthropists, corporations and governments. I have confidence that we can make the change. And that confidence is based on the work I see others doing as they lean into the problem. Let me give you four examples of how people and organisations are intervening to change the shape of the future for the better. Let's start with Yarra Valley Water. In the face of the significant challenges that I spoke about earlier, Yarra Valley Water is totally focused on creating a brighter future for its customers and the environment. It recognises that it needs to do things differently and is acting. As one of the biggest energy users in government, Yarra Valley Water will be 100% renewables by 2025 and at net zero by 2026. It is a leader in the circular economy with one of the largest organic waste to energy facilities in the Southern Hemisphere. Yarra Valley Water is reimagining how to deliver on green fields developments. The Yarra Valley Water approach will result in new master plan communities that amongst other things will be net zero for carbon, produce more water than they use through smart design and recycling, have high biodiversity and blue green infrastructure designed in from the beginning and continue to be profitable for the developers. And it's already putting these plans into action. My second example is from Bush Heritage, is the Nardo Hills property in central Victoria. Because of dramatic increases in temperature, the eucalypts at Nardo Hills are dying. In the past 10 years, almost 10% of the trees have collapsed. Led by volunteer Dr. Gary McDonald and the Bush Heritage team, the team has started a revegetation project using 9,000 grey box and yellow box seedlings drawn from different climatic zones. The project will establish whether, which of the flora from the drier climates around Juni and Narandra will survive and thrive and provide habitat for the many woodland birds, insects and other animals. I love a quote that Gary McDonald said, the nice thing about this project is that rather than sitting back and watching the environment unravel, I'm actually taking tangible action to protect against these impacts. My third example is ClimateWorks Australia. The purpose of ClimateWorks is to accelerate the transition to a net zero economy in Australia, the South East Asia and the Pacific. Originally established 10 years ago with funding and support from the Maya Foundation and Monash University, it started with three staff. Because of the impact of this work, it now has over 60 staff focused on developing pathways to achieving net zero. Climate work, working with others, takes a systems wide approach to the problem and works to develop practical pathways to achieve net zero. 
Its early work has included a special focus on policy and legislation changes needed to achieve net zero. Its work is divided into seven systems, one of which is food and land. It is answering the really important question, can we produce enough food for a growing population while safeguarding our environment and supporting the transition to net zero emissions? This is important because agriculture represents approximately 13% of Australia's carbon emissions. Much of this comes from methane produced by cattle, mainly from their burps, which is 28 more times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. The cattle's methane production is also an inefficient use of energy by the cattle. Energy which could be going into the growth of the cow for meat. Which brings me to my final example of people and organisations acting to find solutions. CSIRO have researched the cow methane problem and found that by turning the seaweed, asparagopsis, I hope I've said that properly, as feedstock, they can reduce methane by 80% and potentially accelerate meat production. They've now formed a company, Future Feed, and they are in the final contract negotiation stage with Woolworths, Grain Corp and Andrew Forrest's Harvest Road to establish a joint venture to take this to the world. So what is the common thread amongst these examples? I think that it's four things. Firstly, a recognition that we have to change and the need for action is now. Confidence that positive change is possible and to deliver it, we need to lean in and act to change the shape of the future. To be successful, we need to solve multiple problems at the same time, building resilience, low carbon transition, improving biodiversity, to name but a few. If it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a community and society to address climate change. None of us can do this alone. So what does this mean that we can think about doing? The task is not easy. Not everyone agrees that it should be done. However, a co coalition of the committed and willing can and are changing the shape of the future. So what can we do? Well, that is a choice for each of us. We can act as individuals, as communities, as organisations, as governments. I've given a few suggestions here as some thought starters. Each of us has a superpower that we can use to help tackle climate change. That superpower can range from volunteering to help replace the tree guards damaged by bushfires, being more efficient in energy in our own homes, starting a business to advance carbon farming, donating money to bush heritage or others to buy land in high biodiversity landscapes where we need to increase the linkages between climate zones to increase the range for animals. The need is urgent. I believe that we are finding the solutions to climate change impact, but we need to lead into the task. The choice for all of us now is to create, is to decide how we want to be involved in that change. To use our superpowers to take action to tackle climate change. Thank you for the, your time this evening. I look forward to your questions. Heather, I'll now hand back to you. Thanks, Sue, and thank you very much for that presentation. There's certainly some sobering facts in there, but also a lot of sense of hope too, and the fact that working together, we can make a difference. And as we head to questions and answers, I'd just like to share a couple of things from Bush Heritage. You know, our, on all of our reserves, we store what's 45 million tonnes of carbon. And people say, well, what does that, how does that equate to something? And that's equivalent to what Melbourne and Sydney emit every year for 15 years. So there are organisations such as ourselves in the many examples that Sue were giving that really highlight the difference that everybody can make uh, by just working together in partnership with others and we can all make a difference. So although at times it may feel like despair, there's also a huge amount of hope. So I'd now like to head to questions. So uh, please keep those questions coming through. So the first one, uh, so, and there's a couple that are sort of a similar theme. So um, 
if you don't mind, uh, those of you who've seen it through, I'll try and sort of group them together. So this is sort of a theme that's come through from Michael and from Maggie. So thank you for the questions. I'm um, just uh, reading them as we speak. So often we can get a sort of a, a dis bit of despair because of the, the lack of action in government um, and concerns around government policy being driven by the fossil fuel industry or a certain media outlet. Um, and how do we actually persuade government to act and when there's still quite a few sort of you know skeptics within those um, you know sort of governing bodies it's uh, it's a really good question because I have to be honest I too have had moments of being going oh, it's just too hard but then I look at the fact that every single state government in Australia has committed to the Paris goals of net zero by 2050 you have large organisations that are committing to that and have, in fact, beyond committing to that, are acting, are acting on it. You have the superannuation funds and the finance industry who are now really dealing with this really seriously because there are commercial impacts. There are people who are really good, and this is where I think a superpower, you, your superpower is important. You've got to work out which bit of this are you going to focus on. I'm focusing on working with organisations to work out how to deal with the uh, build climate change resilience and uh, move to a low carbon environment. I'm not spending my time working on trying to change the mind of people who are in the federal government. Um, there are others who can do that and I think that the, the need is so urgent we need to get on with it because the world that Australia is operating in is changing as well. Uh, China has committed to net zero by 2060. Uh, the EU are just about to bring in, legisla uh, bringing in legislation which are by the end of the year where if you are, I think it is, um, where if you are exporting to the EU and you don't have a, um, a climate tax um, uh, or an emissions trading scheme more to the point in your country, there will be a, a tariff on your exports to to Europe. So there are things, and you know, depending on what happens in the US, that also could be a significant change. So, you know, so what do you do? I, I'm working, I, I work with the Coalition of the Willing um, and uh, others are really good at doing what I think is really heavy lifting, which is dealing with the federal government. Thanks a lot for that one, Sue. We've got one which is sort of a, a political question as well. Sort of heading to another part of the world, um, we've got two countries with um, elections at the moment uh, with very, very different sort of policy settings playing out. So the question is, uh, will the outcome of the US election determine whether the world has some chance of meeting 1.5 degree target? Nothing like a big question on a Thursday night. It's a good, the thing that I find um, uh, interesting with the US is that if you look at what the big states, because they, their states are even more, are even stronger than here in Australia in, in their uh, system of government. So people like California, which would be the, large, the fourth, large, fourth largest, I think, economy in the world, if it was its own state, they're making really strong uh, moves about committing to the Paris goals. So I think that you're seeing a lot that's happening um, at, a st at a state level in the US, but I think the things that are really important are what's happening in China, what's happening in India, what's happening in Southeast Asia, because they're the big ones that will move that, that will move the dial more so than what's going to happen in the US. Thanks, Sue. Um, changing tact a little bit, a uh, question here from uh, Liz, and please, people, keep your questions coming. Um, so the next question is, what can a small environment group do to be an effective climate change influencer? This is probably linking back to your, your superpowers that you're talking about earlier. Yeah. Uh, so. It depends on the context of the environment group. You know, what is the what is your purpose? Uh, because you know, there's environment groups do so many wonderful things in you know in different areas, and so you then need to look at I think three things. Uh, one is uh, 
how is the climate changing that impacts the area of in the environmental conservation that you work on? So, and what do we need to do to respond to that? Uh, and then, yeah, and that might be sort of Nardo Hills style of thing or looking at what, uh, yeah, it might be, you know, you might be in the um, uh, water or, or the oceans. Um, I think that it's good for all of us to really aim to be, uh, get towards net zero because uh, it's, if we're having to deal with the impacts of climate change, we really should be thinking about how we are affecting climate change. But the order and the importance of that, I think, varies a bit. Something like a water authority has to do it because we're such big users, users of energy. And then you need to decide, um, you know, some people, their environmental group really focuses on advocacy. Um, so you need to work out who and where you need to be your advocate. It's so big, you've got to work out your superpower, your purpose, what is the thing that you're going to make the biggest impact in. Right, thanks for that, Sue. Uh, next question is from Karen. Uh, so the Victorian local government elections are on now. Does Yarra Valley Water interact at all at this level with the councils to mitigate climate change? And if so, can you give us some examples of how you work with um, councils? Sure. So Yarra Valley Water works with 23 councils uh, around Melbourne because of the size of our organisation. Um, and uh, what's interesting is, you know, where I spoke about with the greenfields, uh, the greenfields development and having a master plan community that is net positive for water, net zero for carbon, 90% of waste is managed at site. Uh, we have an MOU with the Mitchell Shire who in, it's in their area uh, that, that, we oper that we operate. Uh, so uh, as you would expect with 23 councils, um, it varies a bit, uh, but the majority of them are positive to very positive uh, would be my uh, summation. Thanks for that, Sue. Uh, next question is probably one more directed towards me, so I'll have a go. And this is one from John. How do we encourage the government to adopt the recommendations of the EPBC, so the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Review, um, and make the public aware of the need for this? So one of the things that has been uh, happening is all of the environmental groups, of which we are, are one, have all come together and working very hard with both our supporters and, and member organisations to really spread the root the word about the review. We're all very supportive, most everything that um, Graham Samuel actually suggested. And so we've been um, pushing pretty hard in the political arena to try and make sure that the really positive things out of that review are actually implemented. And particularly the standards and the body that he's suggesting at a federal level that makes sure that it polices those standards is set up. We're very reluctant to have the government uh, cherry pick and also rush through legislation uh, just to try and get things when everybody's distracted uh, with COVID. So um, please be aware that uh, all of the organisations are working pretty hard. You know, welcome any uh, interaction or further questions that you might have and you know, happy uh, if you want to contact me offline, I can run through more of that. But it was a really important uh, review that was done all of us as organisations and a lot of individuals were involved with contributing to that. And we just want to make sure that, uh, you know, the re review just isn't, uh, you know, tick the box and then uh, disappears uh, to a draw. So um, we're certainly working hard to make sure that that information is out there. Um, another sort of um, slightly, and I think it's probably a little bit more of a, a comment, um, is really just around the, the challenges of, of, and it's in the government arena again, of the push towards um, carbon capture and storage uh, as being a solution where, you know, other parts of the world have looked at that and just gone, you know, that's not the pathway forward. So I don't know, Sue, whether you've got any comments on, on that technology or any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, uh, I do actually. Um, so I think where carbon capture and storage has some potential benefits is in some of the industrial processes where it is difficult uh, to get to net zero. And I'm thinking about aluminium, steel, uh, some of the chemicals. 
because you 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 have situations where you don't have potentially you don't have choices. So using uh, carbon capture, um, I think, has some uh, opportunities to provide some benefits there. Using carbon capture with coal, not so much. Thanks for that, Sue. Uh, next is from Jane, and it's really a question about how do we can how do we actually get protection for existing trees? Uh, and we stop the level of, of land clearing that's occurring. And particularly as they're really, you know, effective carbon capture and storage. Uh, so how do we actually stop that? And how do we actually get the balance right in relationship to the, the whole logging debate and, and native forests, et cetera? Yeah, so I think this is a policy area that needs change uh, because uh, if you have uh, 100 hectares of land as ever, many will know on this webinar, and half of it is native and half of it is clear, the way to manage, to maximise your carbon credits would be to put a forest on the cleared land and uh, to clear the, the, the native bush, which does not make sense. Also, if you have native bush and you have a licence to clear it and then you don't clear it, uh, you can get carbon credits for that. So if you're a conservation or you're committed to conserve, you're a farmer and committed to conserving a particular area, um, it doesn't make sense to me uh, that, that that is not covered. So I think that that's a policy, that's a policy issue that needs to be changed. I think the other thing we need to do is do more around uh, the measurement of the carbon in uh, the native, uh, native forests. Uh, because at the moment, to get an assessment of your soil carbon, it costs about $30 a hectare. We need to uh, get that down to about $3, I think. But we also need to get an agreement on the, on the methodology and the understanding. This is an area that I think is underdone in its research about what is the carbon capture uh, and soil carbon and so on associated with native, with native forest. Because a lot of the models... Uh, that are used, and, you know, I spoke about the food and land system that Climate Works is doing the work with Deakin University and CSIRO. It has the models at the moment currently have an assumption that is based on plantation forest rather than on native forest, and that's a gap. So it needs to be filled. So there's three things. Policy, uh, proper proper. Uh, affordable assessment of carbon in native forests and a proper methodology that we can use reliably and successfully. Thanks for that, Sue. And uh, for everybody on this call, Bush Heritage is doing some work with CSIRO and others on a level of that methodology and looking at how we can actually have methodologies that work for all the way from your soil carbon up through your, your grasses, your your understory, all the way up to the current methodologies, which focus on tree coverage at two metres. But as we know, a lot of Australia don't ha doesn't have trees at that sort of height. So there is work being done. I might also just add before we get to the next question that um, recently, as in a couple of weeks ago, we were uh, very, well, I wasn't lucky, we'd done lots of hard work on this and the government in Queensland had to pull and pull and reserve and Queensland became the very first special wildlife reserve, which means it can't be logged, it can't be mined, it has the same protection as a national park. So the more we can have private reserves and other land holdings given that level of protection, then that is fantastic and that will protect the trees into the future. Um, another comment just on the trees, uh, I think this is coming through from Henry, um, and we've heard recently, here we go, that uh, mature trees consume plant of carbon that a new tree will. So I think it's really important uh, that we do actually continue to maintain our old trees. We know that that is a challenge, uh, one change, whether it be projects like Nardu Hills, which are really trying to build that resilience, and as we're seeing some of our trees really not cope with the shock. Um, question here from Karen. Uh, what are your views on the push for regenerative agriculture and farming as a great way of sequestering carbon? So it's interesting. Uh, Nick Burton-Taylor, who's on our board, is Chancellor at Southern Cross University. 
I was talking to Nick a couple of weeks ago and he said the fastest growing course for Southern Cross Uni University is regenerative agriculture, uh, which was uh, really just a really great thing to hear. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, I, I support obviously uh, anything where we are treating in our natural capital as an asset that we need to manage for the long term and that we want to cherish. Um, and we want to do it in a way that is um, viable, sustainably, financially and so on. What's not to like? Yeah. Thanks for that, Sue. Um, bearing in mind that you're a director on a superannuation um, organisation, MRSA superannuation, uh, I was wondering if you could share with us, just not MRSA, but just more broadly what you're hearing around the superannuation organisations and how they're thinking about climate change, and particularly given the sheer volume of funds that they have available from an investment perspective, um, how they're you know dealing with climate change. So it's been... I think over the last five years, there's been a significant change, still more to do. Uh, so MRSA globally runs a MRSA investment forum, which does in five places around the world. Um, it has you know, fantastic speakers, uh, at, you know, not just from MRSA, but you know, just real leaders. What was interesting five years ago was climate change was discussed, but it was almost like they'd had to sort of shoehorn it into the, the presentations. And the, the degree of interest was not super high, I'd have to say. Uh, three years down the track, uh, there were people who were presenting on uh, investment uh, investment assets, particularly with renewables, um, because they were seeing dramatic uh, improvements in the financial returns associated with that, and also starting to get real recognition of the issues around stranded assets for things such as coal and, and you know, other, other assets that may not be fit for purpose sort of five years from now. There's a lot of work being done by um, a whole range of people and some real leadership from people like BlackRock, which is one of the biggest uh, investment houses in the world, uh, really focusing on climate change, a lot more being done on uh, getting hard quantitative measures. Uh, but, you know, it's... Uh, and every single super fund now, to some extent, um, has uh, is able to talk to what they're doing with their portfolios associated with uh, climate change. You're starting to see some real moves uh, from people such as Unisuper and Hester, who are two industry funds, uh, who are, have made announcements about exiting um, uh, assets by you know sort of next year or three years out and things like that. So, uh, real movement starting to happen, and the movement is starting to happen because they see themselves as they are, they need to manage for the long term. And so they need to get returns for their members um, on a long term basis. And for many of them, they, they're saying, well, if we don't think about factor climate change into our assessments of our investments, we are not acting in the members best interest. Thanks very much for that. So, and thank you, Michael, for the, the question. So we've got to uh, the end of our evening, which is a real shame. If anybody's got any further questions or you think about them as soon as you get off the call, then please drop us an email and we'll come back to you with a response to those questions. But I'd just like to uh, wrap up with a, a few points that sort of resonate for me. One of those is, you know, about it. it is it is a big challenge and sometimes we can get a little caught up in, you know, feeling a bit depressed about it. But if we actually work together and if we focus on as organisations, as individuals, as every part of the community on what our superpower is, that we can make a difference. And for us at Bush Heritage, it's by the work that we do on the ground. It is the work we do in places like Nardu Hills or in Hamlin and a, um, a human-induced revegetation project that we're doing up there. It is by extending our corridors so that we've got areas where animals can move through the landscape, uh, particularly as certain areas heat up or they get drier. It's how we continue as all of us to keep water in the landscape and look at how we can do that. So there's lots of things that we're all doing. I know a number of you on this call are supporters of Bush Heritage or supporters of other organisations like Climate Works and others. 
working in this place. And I'd just like to say a huge thank you on behalf of every single conservation organization and others working on this space to really make sure that we have a planet that has that amazing diversity that we all love and we want our kids and our grandkids to love. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for being part of this webinar tonight. And we will be recording it and making it available. So please make sure if you want to share it, share it with your friends and family. But thank you for supporting us. Thank you for being part of tonight. And Sue, thank you so much for sharing your experience across a raft of industries and also for being our president. Thank you for taking us on. Um, and we hope that uh, post COVID, we'll be able to get you out into the amazing landscapes that we saw on the, the introductory video. So thank you, everybody. Stay safe, stay well, and look forward to talking together again in the future. Thanks. Mm -hmm.